Good morning, teachers, students, education officials, parents, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sandra Gift, and I'm a member of the Network of Scholars of the Center for Reparation Research at the University of the West Indies. I would like to acknowledge the director of the center, Professor Vereen Shepard, Mr. Michael Hilton, Mr. Floyd Williams, and staff of the center who support this lecture series, as well as the staff of the UWI Open Campus who are providing technical support this morning. It is my pleasure to be the moderator for this morning's lecture. The Center for Reparation Research fosters public awareness of the lasting and adverse consequences of the European invasion of indigenous people's lands, African enslavement, and colonialism in the Caribbean. It works with national and regional reparation committees to promote education about these legacies and the need for justice and repair. Accordingly, the center is collaborating with the St. Lucia National Reparations Committee, the CARICOM Reparations Commission and other partners to host this regional secondary schools virtual lecture series 2020-2021. The topics addressed relate to the CXC, CSEC and CAPE history curricula and are intended to contribute to enhancement of the knowledge and awareness of young people of the Caribbean about the historical factors that have shaped the socioeconomic realities of the region and that underpin the call for reparations. In commemoration of Black History Month, today's lecture is intended to expose students to the story of the Black Power Movement in Trinidad and Tobago in the late 1960s to 1970s, as told by Kafra Cambon, Ayegoro Ome, and Winston Sweet, three key leaders of the movement. Some of the socioeconomic issues of great concern to the leaders of this movement, but continue to be relevant today, and that are reflected in the CSEC and CAPE curricula, include industrialization, nationalization, and the US imperialism, not only in Trinidad and Tobago, but indeed in the Caribbean region as a whole. Even though Trinidad and Tobago had achieved independence in 1962, the economy was characterized by ownership and control of the most valuable resources, petroleum and agricultural staples, by foreign multinational corporations and the local white elite, which also controls commerce. This meant they had control of the economy. The leaders of the Black Power Movement called for more locals owning land, local ownership of companies operating in the Caribbean, the employment of more locals in these companies and more employment of young people. UE students were actively involved in protests against racism and imperialism organized by the leaders of the Black Power Movement, both in Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica. In Trinidad and Tobago, on February 26, 1970, as a sign of solidarity with Caribbean students protesting against racism in Canada, the National Joint Action Committee, NJAC, and other discontented groups staged a massive demonstration in the city of Port of Spain against Can Canadian racist imperialism. Nine leaders of NJAC were arrested in February and released on March 4th, 1970. On the day of their release, several massive demonstrations began. This eventually led to the Prime Minister, Dr. Eric Williams, making public policy statements to one, deal with foreign control of the economy, two, appoint a commission to investigate accusations of racial discrimination in the business sector, and three, reduce unemployment. However, these promises and assurances did not appease the masses who wanted immediate improvement in their lives. This morning, we are extremely honored to have these three Caribbean black icons on our panel. And it will be my pleasure to introduce each one of them to you before they share their stories about their involvement in the black power movement with us, with a focus on the themes of industrialization, 
nationalization, and US imperialism. We hear, before we hear from them, it is with great pleasure that I invite Mr. Earl Bousquet, Chairman of the St. Lucia National Committee for Reparations and co-host of this lecture series to deliver the welcome message. Mr. Bousquet. Yes, welcome. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, welcome all uh, to today's uh, session, um, the fifth in our continuing series of 2020 to 2021 virtual Caribbean schools history lectures. Today's coinciding with observance of February as Black History Month. In this third direct lecture to schools and students under lockdown, and in classes, we focus our stories they never told us on the history of Black Caribbean icons in the 1970s. These lectures aim to help students preparing for history exams at the secondary levels and are reaching students and teachers in classes regionally and beyond. We also have ensured, as Dr. Gift pointed out, that the lessons offer, that the lessons that we offer fit officially outlined and stipulated curriculum guidelines for general and specific periods of Caribbean history. Today, we will highlight an early historical development in one country with regional impact, but is not referred to in the contemporary history books. The gentlemen we have invited to present today have more in common than being Trinidadians and Tobagonians or Caribbean citizens. They all participated, like Dr. Gibbs said, in meaningful ways in that 1970 event in Trinidad all of 52 years ago. And they will show and tell us why, what they did, and the prices they paid, including in one case as a university student writing the change with his mouth and leading others from in front, telling us about the seeds they planted five decades ago and the fruits born across the Caribbean since. They will tell us that when, or they will tell you, our audience, that when we were growing up as students in those heady black power days in the late 60s and 1970s when I was still at St. Mary's College, secondary students, especially in church schools, were forbidden from using the word black. Why? Well, simply because as far as they were concerned, the, the word black was supposed to be derogatory. So to have been heard or reported as saying what James Brown sang, say it loud and black and I'm proud, to say that on the school compound or even in the streets was an open invitation, you know, to close monitoring and observation in the classroom and facing the harshest punishment for the least of anything you said or did thereafter. We could not mention the word revolution unless it was to speak in glowing terms about the French Revolution of 1789 or that other popular European revolution that is all over our history books, the Industrial Revolution, which was really generated by the proceeds from slavery. But we could not say revolution if talking or asking questions about the Haitian Revolution of 1804 or the Russian Revolution of 1917, both of which significantly changed world history. We are not rewriting history with these lectures, as I was reminded by the Honorable Dr. June Sumer yesterday. But what we are doing is actually and more effectively telling the stories uh, through the rich oral tradition that is part of our Caribbean culture from slavery to now. Yes, we tell our stories in words and songs, calypsos and poetry, storytelling, recounting history from a standpoint 
of having lived it and been part of making it, like our three Trinidadian presenters today. These lessons are important for our history and the future dates we must remember. Today we remember February 26, 1970 in Trinidad and Tobago, is, but there's also another significant gate in Caribbean history also commemorated today, February 25th, 1980 in Suriname, when an army coup resulted in regime change that significantly altered the history of that CARICOM member state forever. But like an, end, like an elderly journalist um, colleague in St. Lucia is wont to say, not a word, not a word, not a word for Caribbean students to read today, all of 52 years later. Why? Because linguistic differences and geographic distance have historically not allowed English speaking Caribbean people to know enough about Dutch speaking Suriname, which favored the colonial divide and rule strategy in the pre-independence period. But still, today, many CARICOM citizens, including students, don't know that the West Indies comprised back then of three Guyanas, British Guyana, French Guyana, and Dutch Guyana, which are today Guyana, the Republic of Guyana, Suriname, and French Guyana, which is still a colony of France. Or, for example, that the three Guyanas are several times larger than the countries in Europe that conquered and controlled them for centuries, Britain, France, and what we knew as Holland um, and is regarded as the Netherlands. Or oh, we did not know, and many will not know, that Guyana and Suriname today have enough oil to change CARICOM for the better forever from tomorrow. But how will we know all of that when we don't even know that Suriname's first heroic black icons were African slaves who settled in the interior and eventually joined the indigenous first people of Suriname's first, joined, excuse me, <clears throat> they joined um, the indigenous first people as Suriname's first freedom fighters against the Dutch. The Europeans taught us to call them Bush Negroes but they call themselves Maroons, what St. Lucians called Neg Maon, which actually means runaway slaves. Today, the vice president of Suriname and the speaker of the parliament of Suriname following recent elections are Maroons who comprise six tribes representing over 200,000 people, more than in any OECS territory and even more than all the six independent OECS territories combined. So let me wrap up by reminding you that the ultimate objective of these lectures is, first of all, to encourage Caribbean students everywhere to embrace history as a subject that will prepare you for your journey through life. Like our generation learned, a tree without its roots cannot stand and we cannot understand ourselves or our mission in life if we don't know our history, where we came from and how we got here. My last message is to use more time, and that is particularly to our students and teachers, to use more time to research your and our history to do what I describe as DRAWL, D-R-A-W-L, drink, read, add, watch, listen, and of course, learn. It is the only way you'll get to know the real stories about Bookman of Haiti and Bussa of Barbados, Coffee of Guyana, Chateauier of St. Vincent, Nani and the Maroons of Jamaica, the Garifuna of St. Lucia and St. Vincent shipped to Honduras and who now populate the coast of Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua, numbering over 800,000, over a million if you are to check those that have migrated to North America. So folks, dig deep and dig deeper for the truth. Search the web, 
reread the headlines and look between the lines, watch and listen. Unlike the great communicator Larry King preached forever in his last years on RT, listen more and talk less because you can't learn anything when you're talking. In which case, I would remind you that this is oral history, but uh, that's for another show, or should I say, for another lecture. Back to you, Madam Moderator. Thank you very much, Mr. Bousquet, for your very pertinent and timely welcome message. Uh, so I am going to be very pleased now to introduce to you Mr. Ayegoro Ome, who will be bringing greetings in his capacity as chairman of the Trinidad and Tobago National Committee on Reparations, but also on behalf of his entire uh, involvement in the Black Power Movement. Before I introduce him, though, I would just like to remind our students and teachers that following the presentations by our panelists, you have the opportunity to post questions and make comments. And so we ask you to bear that in mind and to pay close attention as they go along so that if there's anything you really would like to ask, you take the opportunity to do so and have them respond to you this morning. Mr. Aigoro Ome is the founder of the Sinuhe Center, which was established in 2016. The center is dedicated to providing studies and publications regarding issues pertinent to African and Caribbean culture, as well as facilitating charitable works in Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Ome won a scholarship to the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine in 1967 and read English literature, history, and sociology. He's a foundation member of the National Joint Action Committee, NJAC, formed on the 26th of February, 1969 at the UWI. He was an activist in the Trinidad and Tobago Black Power Revolution of 1970, led by NJAC. He was imprisoned and charged for sedition during the 1970 state of emergency. He graduated with honors in 1970 after having sat his exams while in prison. After his release from prison, he taught history and Spanish at the secondary school level. He's a spiritual elder and has officiated at African Rites of Passage. Mr. Ome has written three books, The Story of Emancipation, I Am a Young King, and Light a Candle, Say a Prayer, Play a Drum Toward an Emancipation Day Ritual. He is a former newspaper columnist and remains a contributor of letters to the editor to the daily newspapers in Trinidad and Tobago. In 1996, he was awarded the Shaconia Medal Silver for distinguished service in the field of culture. Mr. Ome, you have the floor. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Gift. I will not have to introduce myself further. That has already been adequately done by Dr. Gift. But I do want to welcome regional students, and teachers, and parents for this series of history lectures. This is number five, which is being presented by the St. Lucia National Reparations Committee in collaboration with the Center for Reparations Research. It is very fortunate that this is taking place in Black History Month, which is February for some people, but in Trinidad and Tobago, Black History Month is actually November. Nonetheless, it is on a very fortunate date because tomorrow, the 26th of February, will be the 52nd anniversary of the founding of the National Joint Action Committee. And it will be the 51st anniversary of the beginning of what we call the Trinidad and Tobago Revolution of 1970, others term it as the Black Power Revolution. Um, first of all, I want to pay my respects to our moderator, Dr. Gift, um, to the co-host, Mr. Bousquet, and our two distinguished speakers, Professor Emeritus Winston Sweet 
and Brother Kafra Kambon, who is the director of the Re of Regional and Pan-African Affairs of the Emancipation Support Committee. You would have heard that both of our panelists were activists in 1970. But I, I want to take the time as well to congratulate the St. Lucia National Laureates Festival Committee for this school history lecture series. Last year, I wrote in one of my letters to the editor that St. Lucia observes an annual Nobel Laureate Festival in honor of their two Nobel laureates, Sir Arthur Lewis and Derek Walcott. Their birth dates respectively are on January the 23rd, 1915 and January the 23rd, 1930. The lives of these two international personalities tell us much about ourselves as a people because both were grounded in the Caribbean. So Arthur was of Antiguan parentage. Walcott was born in St. Lucia, but lived in Trinidad for a long time. I sincerely hope that you students and teachers who have CAPE and CSEC at your disposal are stimulated by what has been called these stories they never told us as we listen to the history of Caribbean black icons in the 1970s. I want to thank you for having me on this occasion, and I want to welcome you once again to take part in what will be offered. Thank you very much. Sorry, thank you very much for your greetings, Mr. Omi. And just to let our teachers and students know that you will have an opportunity to hear more from Mr. Omi later in this morning's program. It is my pleasure now to introduce our first panelist, Professor Winston Sweet. Returning to Trinidad after obtaining his Bachelor of Science degree in physics at Uwe Mona, Jamaica, Professor Winston Sweet began a career as a secondary school teacher, during which he was greatly affected by the poverty of Black students. His concern for the development of Black students may have generated the initial push for his activism in the Black Power Movement and Revolution, and led to his founding and leadership of the Universal Movement for Reconstruction of Black Mobility, UMROBI. Issues targeted by UMROBI via its demonstrations and protests included unemployment among Black youth, racism, and the unjust shooting of one of their members, Basil Davis. Professor Sweet was detained for six months in the 1970 state of emergency and again for nine months in the 1971 state of emergency. After his release the second time, he continued his studies in engineering, which he had started and received his Bachelor of Science Civil Engineering degree with honors in 1974. In 1978, he became the first person in Trinidad and Tobago to earn a Doctor of Philosophy degree in civil engineering. Professor Sweet was a lecturer at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus and received the title of Professor Emeritus from the university. He also served the University of Trinidad and Tobago as Vice Provost. His current focus is on the Caribbean economic path forward, reparation for African slavery, ending regional poverty and inequality, and the environment and climate change. Professor Sweet, over to you, sir. Um, Professor Sweet, please unmute your mic. Is that all right? 
Yes, thank you. I would like to thank my colleagues for their contribution to the morning's session. But I hope that the question and answer section will constitute the more enriching part of the exercise. So what I will do is virtually list certain issues and hope that they will generate two things. One, some discussion here, and two, as Mr. Bousquet said, that it will take you to doing some research and discussion in your classroom. I have addressed the issue of the 1970 revolution or the 1970 Black Power movement, whatever name one chooses to, to use, in terms of what I consider as streams, streams of influence. And I would approach this first by listing what I consider as the most immediate or proximate causes or influences or streams of influence on the 1970 Black Power movement. The first one that comes to mind, which in fact was the most dominant one when we formed our organization, Omrobi, in 19. 69 was a question of high unemployment in the south of Trinidad. In other words, the area that was the center of the industrial strength of the economy of Trinidad, oil and gas and asphalt, but also the center of the sugar operations. Unemployment among the youth, particularly the black youth, was the first stream of influence. The second stream was the growth of what we called later housing plannings. This is medium rise buildings for low income people or some cases they were called housing schemes. Some of these settlements were single buildings, some were two and three story buildings that housed the disadvantaged, largely unemployed. But there was another segment of housing, if you could call it that, which was the squatter settlements that were distributed throughout Central and South of Trinidad in particular, but had historically been known to surround the capital cities of Port of Spain by way of Beatum. Some of these settlements have had some change, physical change, but they remain the residents of poverty. The other stream, the other sub area of that was the apparent discontent. This is where we became more what some may call political. The apparent disconnect of the government of Trinidad and Tobago with the large disadvantaged communities. And next, the disappointment with the rate of the solution of the vestiges of slavery and colonialism through persistent racism in the society. And I would like you students to take note 
I would suggest that you read Mr. Mr. Buske reference one doc, one um, author. I will re reference both of them. Eric Williams, Capitalism and Slavery, and C.L.R. James, Black Jacobins. My suggestion is that you at CXCN Cape should read these books. The next issue was the disappointment with the economic trajectory of the country. That is the ownership of the national economic base. Petroleum, sugar, asphalt, banking, insurance, to name the dominant parts. The next issue was our disappointment in the post-independence era. That is, we have become independent from 1962. That is Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica in the main. The other Caribbean territories became independent subsequently. But I, I use that as the, what I call the post-independence period. That is 1962 to 1970, the period in focus at present. The next thing I would like to list is the national politics. And here I talk about Trinidad in particular. The society had unfortunately developed into a two-party system by the time we approached 1970. And what some people described as the PNM and African party and the other party that had gone through a series of changes in names from the DLP, the PDP, et cetera, that were considered the East Indian party. We seem locked in this division and the question of building a nation had somehow or the other become derailed or had not gone further after we had gone through independence. I would like to add to that the cultural alienation that was developing and becoming more manifest in Trinidad and Tobago, specifically with the question of the interest in Africa and African culture. This had been growing, it was always there like a virus, but it was growing more and more pronounced. I am not going to go into all the manifestations of this, but this was growing in Trinidad during that period of 1962 to 1970. We must consider what we could some call the African awakening. Some would like to describe the whole 1970 issue as a mimicking of what others see as the African American reawakening, then called the Negro movement in America. But historically, we in Trinidad and you students must become aware of a very powerful influence that was West Indian in origin. That is the Marcus Garvey movement. And that's another area I suggest that you, in preparation for your exams, and a mature contribution to the CISD must read about the Garvey movement. And I will tell you a little thing about that. The Garvey movement at its heights had more than 6 million, 6 million members in support. The largest collection of members 
was in the United States and then in Jamaica. And Trinidad and Tobago was the next largest number of Garveyite groups that spread from Port of Spain among the dock workers to as far south. And these influences were part of the background to our 1970 movement. And they in turn also influenced the Butler movement. And that's another issue that you all have to read about. But above all, out of these proximate causes was an appetite for public education outside of the schools. Many of the groups that were organizing or active in Trinidad engaged in a lot of public education. I remember when we started in San Fernando, one gentleman, he was then in his possibly 60s or 70s, came one day to our one hour meetings and, and gave me a book. It is a very important book, most likely out of print, but if you students see it, it's worth looking at. It's called Sex and Race by J.A. Rogers. The next issue in terms of influences on the Black Power movement, less proximate, is what I call the early streams. I have touched on some of them. And therefore, I am considering early as before 1969. There was in Trinidad, there were several groups of persons prior to 1979. The Garvey movement I spoke about is just one of them. But we had an influence that went back as far as the first decade of the 20th century of migration of back to Africa members in Trinidad. This back to Africa movement started in fact out of the Lamantil area immediately after slavery where some slave ex-slaves demanded that they be returned to Africa. This is 1834. And that is another part of your history that you have to read about. But there was a subsequent movement in the first decade, first and second decade of the 20th century, that is 1900 to about 1920s, of people from Trinidad that I know about, I'm sure there would be a have been people from other, other territories who sought to go to the then American ex-colonies, the Sierra Leone and Liberia. In fact, I remember as a young man, my grandmother sending me to post letters. Her younger brother had I am not sure whether I should use the word migrated or run away, but it's interesting. The morning that the First World War was declared, 1914, she tells me that was the day when her brother Richie decided to embark on a boat destined for Nigeria. There was some program, which the British tend to want to conveniently forget, of a call for West Indians to go and assist in the construction of railways. So as a young man, I would post letters to, to my great uncle who went to, 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 Ni to Nigeria. In fact, he was living in the part that later on was called Biafra. He never came back to Trinidad. He remained there till his death. There were one or two other people from Princess Tong, I remember, who had gone to Liberia. 
they had gone in the 1940s. So that's another area of interest. Then we have the religious strings. I grew up in Princeton where I was born, where there was a strong grouping of Shango, Orisha, Shota Baptists, and then called Orthodox Muslims. In fact, there's a gentleman who is who was, he's now dead, married to my a cousin, a first cousin of mine. He was the first black person that I knew was a Muslim. And this goes back to the 1950s. Princess Tong became, in a sense, a center, one of the centers, as is Lavantel of this Orisha Shango African religion centers. Most of you all would have heard of Papa Niza. And the other thing I want to mention to you all is the Pan-African movement. We in Trinidad have reason sometimes to be very selfish in our pride because a part of Trinidad called Tanapuna generated no less than five of our outstanding Trinidadians who made an international impact on what is now called the Pan-African movement. There was one Sylvester Williams, he was the first, who started in 1897 out of London, the early thrust for Back to Africa, which continued as the Pan-Africanist movement from 1900 to 1910, just before the First World War and the Paris conventions. And we had a gentleman whose name is Nurse, but who, who's real, whose name is Nurse, but he changed his name to George Padmore. That is one of the luminaries who took the fight for West Indian independence on the one hand, independence of the African countries, on the other hand, and the first Pan-Africanist convention. I would deviate to mention another African of which we Trinidadians are very proud is CLR James, who I mentioned earlier on, was the author of In particular, the Black Jacobins, which is the seminal work in not only activist environment, but academic environment on the Haitian Revolution. And I su strongly suggest that this is a document. I remember when my daughter was doing CXC, that was one of the books I went and bought and gave her a copy for herself. I think it's important for you all to understand the Haitian Revolution and its importance to not only the Black struggle throughout the world, the reparation question, the independence of the West Indies, and the independence of Africa and the African Union, but the quest for a new path for the development of black people. The Haitian Revolution is the first and successful revolution in world history. A revolution against tremendous odds. 
when you read that book, you would see how important. And we have a poet here who wrote a, a, a poem. I call it a poem. Some people call it a calypso, where he spoke about Haiti, we are sorry. And I suggest that you all go and Google that calypso, Haiti, because it talks about the indebtedness of the rest of the Caribbean in particular and the African people in general to the Haitian experience. The other thing I want to just mention, as I said, I'm dealing with headings to whet your appetite to go and look for certain things, is what I call the American experience or the American influence or the American stream. I was looking at a document just a few days ago where someone was talking that the Americans were discussing slavery as from 1619 in South Carolina to 1834. And someone with wider experience pointed out that instead of talking of 400 years of slavery, it is correct to say 500 years of transatlantic slavery of the African. Because slavery of the African in the Caribbean, in fact, began with Columbus in 1502. Columbus engaged in the use of slave labor, particularly with respect to Hispaniola. That was the start of it. Okay. So in fact, we are talking about 500 years, not 400 as the Americans choose. But that just by the way, that I'm, uh, I'm sure you're you, Professor Sweet, could you just... Yes, wrap up in two minutes and then you will have an opportunity later on to share some further thoughts. All right, just a few minutes. Thank you. I would like you as students to know about the great impact of American, African-American music. African-American culture. African-American athletics and sports. But I would like also to mention, someone sent me something on my cell phone a few days ago about African achievement in technology, because many of our unread friends and even colleagues talk about the failure of the African to do intellectual work in science, to engineering, etc., And to disabuse these people's minds, I'm going to make available to Mr. Buski a list of a phenomenal achievements of Africans in the field of discovery in science, etc. I just want to tell you that you should read about the contribution of, of the resistance to the civil rights movement that led to a Trinidadian, Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture at the time of Martin Luther King, the work of Malcolm X that is now on the television because the FBI and the NYPD are now 
being charged with conspiracy in the murder of Malcolm X 58 years after. I want to stress in closing the importance of the Rastafarian movement. I want to stress finally the particular song by Bob Marley that became the most popular song the world over. That was in fact Bob Marley put into words the address that Selassie presented to the League of Nations in 1936. I will close by saying that we in the Black Power Movement, both in Trinidad, in the region, must recognize the work of our Calypsonians. They are our poets. They capture what we feel, what we think, our experience, sometimes even better than our professional or academic historians and journalists. I will stop at this point and I'll be willing to deal with some of the consequences of 1970 in the question section. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sweet. It is now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Kafra Kambon, our next presenter. Kafra Kambon has been a well-known national figure in Trinidad and Tobago since 1970, when he was one of the black, well, one of the leaders of the Black Power movement, which brought positive social and economic changes to the country and stimulated changes throughout the English speaking Caribbean. He served as the chairman of the Emancipation Support Committee of Trinidad and Tobago from its founding in 1992 until 2019. He is currently the organization's director of regional and Pan-African affairs. Professionally, Kafra Kambon is an economist. During his formal professional career, he founded and served as managing director of Kaf Shara Services, which provided services in field research, data analysis, and human impact assessments for major development projects. Currently, he is a regional coordinator of the Caribbean Pan-African Network an umbrella body of regional civil society organizations formed in 2004 and linked to the diaspora initiative of the African Union. In 2009, he was appointed as permanent representative to the Economic, Social and Cultural Council of the African Union on behalf of Caribbean civil society. More recently, he has represented Caribbean civil society organizations at various meetings organized by the African Union. In 2002, the government of Trinidad and Tobago awarded Mr. Cambon the Chaconia Medal Silver for community work. He is the author of the book For Bread, Justice and Freedom, a political biography of George Weeks. Over to you, Mr. Cambon. Thank you very much, Mrs. Gift, and thanks to the organizers for having me on this program this morning. And welcome to all the students whom I'm so sorry I cannot see. I usually like to see the faces of those to whom I speak. Uh, but I, I'm glad to be able to share uh, some, some memories and some information on one of the most significant years in the recent history of the Caribbean because it was such a transformative year. And it is really a year that is symbolic, not of a single year, but of a, a particular period in our history. It's just that 1970 was the most outstanding year in, in, in that period. And uh, I am very proud of the fact that I was able to be a part 
of that important movement, along with uh, Brother Ayaguru, who spoke earlier, and uh, Brother Winston Sweet as well. And uh, it is a most memorable year for people like me, people like us, whereas the year was a nightmare for others because it was a year which brought about many changes, fundamental changes in our society and influenced similar changes in other parts of the Caribbean. And I'm sure that the students in St. Lucia uh, can go back and do the reading and see how the, the influence that it had in St. Lucia, because it had an influence throughout the region. Now, to give you a sense of the of what it felt like in 1970, on April 9th of 1970, you had a funeral for a young man whose name was Basil Davis. I did not know him. He was not a figure known to the population of Trinidad and Tobago. He was a regular grassroots brother, one of the thousands and thousands of people who attended mass demonstrations in that period. And those demonstrations ran into the thousands, sometimes the tens of thousands of people. And yet, when Basil Davis was going to be buried, he had a funeral that some people estimate the attendance as high as 100,000. I cannot gauge it, but I have never seen before or since so many people at a funeral in my, in my lifetime. And that was for a young man who did not speak on any platform and who did not have a national profile, a regular grassroots brother. But you see, his, the manner in which he was killed, the environment at the time, because April 9th was at the height of the Black Power movement. So it, there was a certain environment at the time. People responded a certain way uh, to what they considered injustice. And Basil Davis had been shot point blank range by a policeman when all he was doing was pleading for them not to carry down a young man, carry him to the police station, that is, who was not too right in his head. You know, he had a little mental problem and so on. With that miserable, nobody took him on. Everybody was sympathetic to him. And here he was being dragged off by this policeman. Basil Davis begged for him, and the policeman shot him at point blank range. And that stirred a feeling in the society that brought out these tens of thousands of people for his funeral. And just as that was invigorating to those who were part of the movement, it was also a major source of worry for the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And we had no doubt that some move would be made after that to suppress this movement. Because this movement had challenged many things in the society and many very powerful interests in the society. The, the, the term black power, which came to define the movement and its ideology came really as an influence from the United States. Nobody in Trinidad sat down and decided let's have a black power movement. The influence of black power in the United States came um, and spread throughout, particularly the grassroots urban areas in the society. It also had a tremendous impact on campus. I, I was a student at the time that Kwame Ture, who is a Trinidadian, declared black power in the United States. He's the one who introduced in the popular mind, it was said before him, but he's the one who popularized it in the popular mind, not only in the United States, but globally. And it had that impact here 
it had an impact in other Caribbean islands and St. Lucia was not ex um, accepted from it. And it resonated with people for good reasons, having to do with the structure of our society at the time and having to do with the fact that racism, <laughs> white racism was an ingrained feature of our country at the time. If we looked at the business structure at that time, for example, now bearing in mind that the population of whites in the society, according to the census was 4%, 4% of the population was white. And Africans were 40% of the population. The Indian community, because we have a large community of people who were brought from India in a period of indentureship, which followed slavery. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that once you are doing Caribbean history. So I don't have to go into that. So you had this 40, 40 each side. On the other hand, whites were about 4% of the population. And I, I would now look at percent in population and percent in what was considered the business elite because a study was done in 1969 and you could look this up by Acton Kamehu who was a lecturer at the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine. And he did a study of the group called the business elite, those who controlled the major industries and not just a local business elite. This did not include uh, the people who, repre who were part of the big oil companies and all of that. They looked at this was a local thing. And what that elite found, what, what that study found is that the 4% of the population, the whites, were 53% of that business elite. There's a group of people who uh, he described in his study as off-whites, many people who were of Syrian, and Portuguese descent. And they, 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 they comprised 15% of the business elite. And that was an extremely small um, group within the, the population. And the Chinese who were less than 1% of the population, they were 9% of the business elite. Uh, if we come down to the, the people who, were, who had come from India as indentures, they were 9% of the business elite, even though they were 40% of the population. And Africans, who were also 40% of the population, we were only 4% of the business elite. You continue to look at the economics of the time. And if your skin was dark, you could not get a job in a bank, except as a doorman. Not even, not even the, the, the counter staff or the clerical staff. If your skin was dark, and even if it was not very dark, uh, could get a job in a bank at the time. So that was just symbolic. It's something that people uh, remember most because that was in your face. But in everything, you had a country club that had no membership, did not allow African people to be members and refused to allow even uh, foreigners of distinction who were African or who were black in any way uh, to play in their golf club and all of that. You had, you had some big controversies developed over that. So discrimination and economic in inequality was entrenched in the society. And the people who were at the bottom of the ladder were Africans and Indians basically. And discrimination did not just go straight on the race that you African or you Indian, but there was also discrimination on the basis of color. So that those who were lighter skinned had better chances, more opportunities open up to them within the society. That is why when Kwame Ture issued that 
powerful phrase, black power in the United States movement, and that was in 1966. It resonated in Trinidad and Tobago. And before you had a, a, a national joint action committee, which I was a part of, Brother Ayaguru was a part of and so, you find that on the, what we call the blocks in Trinidad and Tobago, because you had a lot of unemployed people, some of them had high good qualifications, academic qualifications and all of that. And it is what we call the blocks. I don't know what it's called in, in, in St. Lucia, but you know where young men mainly, a few women would get together and just line and talk among themselves. When I talk about the blocks, that's what I'm talking about. Those kinds of liming spots um, that, that, you, you, that, that was strongly influenced by that black power movement. And it had its impact on the campus. Macandal Dagger was the, his name was Geddes Granger then. He was the president of the Students Guild at UWI uh, in, the late, in the late 60s. I, I went on to campus um, in 1966. Um, come to think of it, it's the same year that Kwame Touré spoke about Black Power. Um, so I, I, I was on campus in, from 1966 to 1969, and Ayaguru was there on the campus as well, Some, somewhat within the same period. He had a, he was maybe came in a year after I did. And the campus was a hotbed of, you see to us, education wasn't just about the formal subjects that we were taught. And you had an environment of thought. You had an environment where people were encouraged. And a lot had to do with the lecturers at the time. And we as students were encouraged to look deeply into our society. There was a group which was formed by people like the late Lloyd Best, who was uh, an economics lecturer on the St. Augustine campus. And that new world group was encouraging independent thought and encouraging students, the lecturers like Norman Govan and Lloyd Bess and so, were encouraging students to get out of a mold of accepting, you know, the formula that come from outside as though other people have defined the world and all we have to do now is learn their definition of the world and then look at our own environment from that perspective. New World Group was an intellectual challenge to that. And that New World Group had an influence on many of the students on the campus at the time. I am a person who could never accept just formally that somebody else has created and say, look, I have to adapt that to my environment or so. Um, you know, you look at what other people see, and I, I, I want to put this out to you as students now. You can learn from what others have said, but you have to use your own imagination, your own knowledge, your own analysis of what you are confronted mm -hmm. with to try to develop your own positions out of that. And if it's one message I want to give you at this time, it's the critical importance of independent thought for people who were colonized. Because even after formal colonization ended, because of that formal colonization had ended for Trinidad and Tobago, four years before, uh, not four years, uh, six, eight, eight years before 1970, but we had not yet started to, to think for us. We hadn't decolonized our education system. We hadn't decolonized business. You know, that is why you have that kind of structure that I spoke about at the beginning. And therefore, we would still, unless we had been exposed to something else, we would still be thinking in the mold in which we would um, train to think by those who had, had colonized us. So, so Black Power emerged as an ideological change to this, uh, um, challenge to this, and it became more than a challenge as it became active through activism 
which was led by students, but we worked very closely with trade unions in the society. We worked closely with a number of grassroots groups from throughout the country, many of which had come together under that stimulus of black power, which had an impact both because of, you know, the way people regarded the United States, I suppose, and also the fact that Kwame Toure, who was then Stokely Carmichael, was a national of Trinidad and Tobago who had migrated to the, to the United States. And the terminology itself had a certain resonance because of the racist society in which we live. You look at the economic structure, but you look at the aesthetics, the whole aesthetics, we were dominated not just economically, but what was our concept of beauty? Every single year you had a beauty queen show in Trinidad and Tobago, and the winner would always be white. In fact, you, could, you hardly ever had dark, uh, black as a general to <laughs> non-white, but especially dark-skinned contestants. You just did not have that. It was really a white beauty queen show, and that person was considered the beauty. So a standard was being reinforced. I can't say it was being set. It had already been set for the society. It is a standard that made our women feel um, ashamed of their hair type, made us feel, you know, that we were less because of the color of our skins. You know, it was a standard that made us feel like something, especially if we came from the African continent, something was lesser about us. And that is, that is something psychological that our society had to overcome. That is why the, 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 the term black power, that's, you know, became so important because it, it was striking at the heart, not just of the economic power structure, but in terms of those values that could humanize us or could dehumanize us. And we had absorbed values that were dehumanizing because if we are not satisfied or if we are dissatisfied about our natural phenotype, our color of skin, our features, our hair, and all of that. If, it is, if that is a burden of dissatisfaction, and that is coming on top of a misconception of our history, because I went through the education system up to the university level without learning anything in that entire education system, even though at university it had something called development of civilization, that no matter what course you were doing, you had to take development of civilization. And through none of it did I learn any positive African history. My history through my education started in the Caribbean when my four parents were brought here in chains. And if you have such a limited view of yourself, what that does is limits your imagination. You know, there are individuals who overcome anything, but you have to look at what is the mass impact on the majority of people who are subjected to such a misconception of themselves. The Black Power Movement, appropriately termed, really overthrew that. And it has such an impact on people as they developed, because, you know, it, it, we, we just, um, you know, moved out into the communities. We had all these links with trade unions, uh, with grassroots organizations, etc. And as it moved out into the communities, it brought about that kind of transformation. It's the kind of transformation that would make us feel a sense of unity, brotherhood with each other, and also feel a strong bitterness about our economic position in the society. Because people always resented the idea that there were jobs that they could not get no matter how qualified. People resented that. You know, people resented that beauty queen business. People were very dissatisfied about where the Africans stood in the economy of Trinidad and Tobago. 
All that it really needed was a spark that could get people to really challenge that status quo. And Black Power was that, was that challenge. Am I getting a signal? Yes, I you are. <laughs> yes, OK. Uh, yes, so Black, Black Power was that, was, was that spark that, that brought us around to, to dealing with that. And it made major transformations. I'll wind up extremely quickly. Very major transformations because the nationalizations of those major industries, because it wasn't just black and white, you know, it was a question of white foreigners were the dominant people. All the major industries, the oil, the banking, sugar, could you imagine that was a major industry at the time? And all that was in the hands of the, of the foreigners. And that is what was challenged by the Black Power movement. I'd have to leave the rest for questions because I, I always respect time. I, I, I have complete respect for, for Sandra. She's, um, I've known her for a very long time. She's a great person. So, uh, but on the whole, I do respect uh, time. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Cambon. And before we um, open up our question and answer session, we invite Mr. Omi to share with us his perspectives on the information shared by our two panelists. Well, good, good day again. I have, I have listened with um, great interest to what Brother Kamban and Brother Winston Sweet have said. Um, what is critical for us to understand is that 1970, the, the mass movement also mobilized the East Indian community. Um, that has not been mentioned much. I don't know if I missed anything when I stepped out to the room for some brief moments. But one of the things that developed during that period, as Kamban has quite rightly stated, is that NJAC was the catalyst for pulling together a number of strands that had developed in the country, the university community, the, the obvious, the, 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 the um, the trade unions, which had been there since the, the 30s. But at a particular point in the, because we had 56 days of demonstrations during 1970, at a particular point, a banner was put up by some young men who came from Western Trinidad. And the banner stated very emphatically, Africans and Indians unite now. The problem that would have existed with the use of the term black power, and I, I am not so much apologetic in stating that we uh, who have been with NJA called it the Trinidad and Tobago Revolution of 1970, is that there has been a constant erosion of the question of how expansive the movement was. Yes, what Kamban said is quite correct. The, the term black power became the dominant expression, but that banner also represented the fact that within NJAC, we were concerned about the fortunes of the East Indian community. And on the 12th of March, 1970, Thousands of Africans marched from Port of Spain to central Trinidad, where the majority of East Indians were living, in a solidarity gesture that you too have to be a part of this process of transforming our society. The whole movement was transformative. And what is also very important in mentioning the question of the East Indian community is that the movement of 1970 as led by Makandal Daga encompassed Trinidad, 
encompassed Tobago, the other island of our twin island republic, and it encompassed the East Indians. And at a particular point, the East Indian community actually, those who were working in central Trinidad in the cane fields, rebelled against their own traditional leadership. There was a man called Badis Sagan Miraj, who was both head of the Hindu religious group called the, the, the Mahasabha. And he was also head of the trade union that represented the East Indian workers. And the East Indian workers actually rebelled against his leadership. And I remember when we marched past, and that march to central Trinidad, and we marched past Bazes Sagan Maharaj's home, we, we've actually seen subsequently um, clippings that the, the either the BBC or the Canadian um, broadcast company had, where Bazes Sagan Maharaj had guns, rifles, and pistols laid off with as a threat against the predominantly African marchers. So when the East Indian community recognized all that was happening based on the rhetoric that was coming off the platform of the National Joint Action Committee, there was a drastic change and the East Indians began to rebel against the trade union leadership of Badi Sagan Maharaj. But they also, re Africans as well, who were in other trade unions, also rebelled against their trade union leadership. And at one particular point, uh, Kamban can tell you about that, NJAC was actually negotiating on behalf of workers. The movement has become so powerful. So the East Indian community recognizing that there was a greater need for solidarity, decided that they were going to march to Port of Spain via an area called Curep, where there's a junction, and come in jointly with the Africans into Port of Spain. That sent absolute and total panic the government. And Eric Williams on that date declared the night before, a state of emergency. That is when we were imprisoned. That particular gesture of the Africans and the Indians coming together in solidarity. The story is that had we all come into Port of Spain together, the government would have fallen. And we know for a fact that the then government was holed up in the Trinidad Hilton. There was an airplane on the tower waiting to ship them out of the country. The state of emergency was declared. The Americans sent in their warships. They were off Trinidad and Tobago. The Venezuelans sent in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what happened, and it, it has been touched upon so far, is that there were very serious consequences coming out of all that took place during the 56 days of 1970. Um, for those who are students, I, I will tell you quite frankly, Students took a very important part in the movement of 1970 going into 71, 72. And we have photos and we recall secondary school students demonstrating in solidarity with soldiers who had been imprisoned by the government at the time. And coming out of that, this is not very much ventilated. The concept called the CXC came out of discussions that st students had in 1972, because all through Trinidad and Tobago, there were student groups in solidarity with the National Joint Action Committee. And in 1972, there was a big convention on education at Shagaramas, which was chaired by the then Prime Minister, Eric Williams. Um, I'm sorry that I can't read out any aspect of the deliberations of that event. But one of the things that emerged is that we wanted a complete 
reformation of the education system. And out of the appeal and the strident statements of the students, CXC emerged. You, you can check your records if you wish. There, there's no doubt about it. The students at that time were saying, we want African history. We want East Indian history. We want Chinese history. They want the true history of the Caribbean peoples. So there's a lot that we need to look at. We, we just don't have the time, but there's so much that we need to do. The problem is, just as it's been stated here, there are stories that they never told us. And that is very important. And we need to understand why these stories were never told us. Here we are, 52 years after the formation of NJAC and 51 years after the events of 1970. And you are now hearing the story. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Mr. Omi. So we are now opening up the session to our students and teachers and other listeners, other participants for your questions or comments. I think you've had a morning of rich contributions from all of our speakers. You've heard about the several streams of influence which impacted the Black Power Movement, a wide range of them. The impact of the movement, the Black Power Movement in the USA on the Caribbean. You've heard about the structure, economic, economic structure and its links to the racial composition of our society. The impact of UE students at the time and the rich environment of intellectual thought in which they existed and the, the relationship with the academic community which, which fed that environment as well and who were also very active in the movement. You've heard about the efforts to embrace the Indian community and the consequences of this for the trade union movement leading to the state of emergency and the imprisonment of the leaders of the movement. And it's really very instructive to know that all of our speakers this morning have been the victims of imprisonment because of their leadership within the Black Power movement. And at that time, well, there's ultimately Mr. Uwe just referred to the issue of imperialism in terms of the backing of the government at that time, but the, by the US government, but also by the government of Venezuela. So there are much, there's much food for thought that will allow us to have a deeper appreciation of this is aspect of the Black Power Movement in Trinidad and Tobago, which also impacted events in Grenada, events in Jamaica, and as, of course, which continue today. Many of these issues continue today, as we see in, in, in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement and the issues which continue to be the cause for a lot of ad advocacy on the part of people of African descent in all parts of the world. So uh, let's see questions that you might have. We have um, one question from Facebook. Um, the question is, or it's really more of a comment perhaps, uh, we have underutilized and celebrated the decade for people of African origin to take up on the US Black History Month. Is there any wonder we are not making progress, we are not making progress on the reparation agenda fast enough? Um, perhaps that question could be addressed initially by Mr. Busquet. Yes, certainly. Um, the, at a national level, uh, we have not done enough to observe the international decade, um, which ends in 2024, and half of it, um, we are in the middle of it. Um, I would, however, disagree that we have not done enough insofar as our spreading of the reparations message, because remember the uh, CARICOM Reparations Commission was established in 2013, that is seven years ago. Um, it remained effectively quiet for the first five years while governments hemmed and hawed over how fast or slow um, we should go and the extent to which 
um, there will or should be uh, different levels of involvement. However, the George Floyd uh, event, again, and this brings into question the issue raised by our speakers in terms of the influence of developments in the United States um, uh, on developments in the, in, the, in the Caribbean. What we have here is that as a result of the George Floyd uh, incident, it galvanized the reparations movement across the, both sides of the Atlantic throughout the Caribbean, and in the period since then, we have seen governments come on board more than ever. We have seen national committees get better responses to the reparations issue. And uh, after CARICOM on Emancipation Day 2020 adopted the blueprint by Sir Arthur Lewis, in his book, Labor in the West Indies, which students, every issue, every lecture, we tell you to download it. It's on Google, Labor in the West Indies by W. Arthur Lewis. In 1939, he drew up the blueprint for reparations. And 81 years later, in uh, 2020, CARICOM adopted that blueprint as the one that is going to be guiding um, guiding us in our negotiations with Europe. So while we have not done much on the decade, we are satisfied that we are doing um, well. Not the best, there's always room for improvement, but we are doing well enough in getting the reparations message uh, across. But we do accept the criticism that not enough has been done uh, for the decade and um, halfway through, we have already pledged that we will be doing much more in St. Lucia and at the level of the CARICOM Reparations Commission. Thank you very much, Mr. Buski. I'm not seeing any other questions at this time, but I would like to myself to pull a question to the panel. Um, and that is your perspectives on the sustainability of the gains that were made during the Black Power Movement. Um, for example, one of the issues was the fact that many companies were foreign owned and following the Black Power demonstrations and so forth, there was an effort made to nationalize more companies. There was also an effort made to employ more locals in the banking sector, for example. And I think it was obvious because I myself was a, a child of the 1970s that there was a heightened consciousness and awareness of black identity. Um, there are those who argue that some of those gains have been sustained or that they were significant, and there are others who would argue that they were not sustained. So I would welcome your views on, on that issue, whether you believe that the successes that were achieved at the time were sustained, and if not, why not? Um, I, would, I would say insofar as St. Lucia, um, and I've been, been wanting to make that point that all of the presenters made the point that what happened in 1970 reverberated across the region. And that has been part of the cycle of history. Haiti in 1804 reverberated around the world. And Haiti marked the start of the end of transatlantic slavery. Uh, in 1938, the revolutions called revolts by the British um, commissioner, the Stobie commissioner, etc. Arthur Lewis took one year's leave from his lecturing at London School of Economics to tour the entire Caribbean during 1938 to personally witness those events that led to the appointment of the Stobie Commission. And it is coming out of those findings that he wrote that book, which you cannot get the reparations message if you haven't read Sir Arthur Lewis's Labor in the West Indies, published in 1939. The, um, like I said, the, he's been um, regarded as the intellectual author for Caribbean reparations. But way back in 1938, we don't have to wait till 1970, 
the situation that um, Omi and others were describing where um, the color of skin mattered as to whether you could get a job. We have a fantastic story in St. Lucia. In 1938, it was difficult, it was impossible for black St. Lucians to get a job at Bar Barclays Bank. And as a result of that, a young entrepreneur called John Quentin Charles, who today is known as JQ Charles, he had been fortunate enough to use his brains to acquire property. And um, he joined with other local business persons in the cooperative movement. And they established St. Lucia's first indigenous bank. It was called the St. Lucia Cooperative Bank, but it was better known as the Penny Bank because unlike Barclays Bank, where you needed to have color and name to open an account, the cooperative bank was called the Penny Bank because you could have opened an account with a penny. And that Penny Bank has grown and developed and metamorphosed into the first national bank of St. Lucia as we speak today. That's its new name. But the first National Bank of St. Lucia, which was established in 1938, 81 years later, as we speak today, is, has purchased the remains of the Royal Bank of Canada in St. Lucia and the OECS. So I think the lesson that J.Q. Charles drew by establishing that bank with J.H. Pilgrim and the others and just in the same way, like they talked about um, in Trinidad, um, black people could not have joined the country club. We had a similar experience. No black persons could have joined the country club back in 1938. But after JQ established the bank and purchased the biggest cocoa and coconut um, estates in St. Lucia, he was given honorary membership of the St. Lucia club or the Castries Club, what it was called. The first and only black man given membership because he had uh, acquired sufficient property to make it. And quickly moving on from there to the results and the effects of 1970 on the Caribbean. Yes, it had its effects in St. Lucia by then the likes of George Odlum, Peter Josie, Calix George, a number of the others who are elders like us all um, presenters today, they did their roles in introducing the concept of black power in St. Lucia through something called the Forum. And in 1969, the Forum was launched in 1970, 71. In 1970, Julian Hunt as the mayor of Castries led a demonstration in Castries against the fact that tourists white tourist women were wearing bikinis in town. So the mayor of Castries had a demonstration against that in 1971. By 1974, the Black Power movement had taken over the Labour Party, Odlum and Josie, and um, had brought the Labour Party, which had evolved from the West Indies Labour Party movement to the uh, Black Power movement and had brought it to the level of participating in politics. And by 1979, we know that the movement won. And um, five years after independence, the government lost, the then government lost um, because the mood in 1979, after the Grenada Revolution, after the Iranian Revolution, and in the spirit of what had happened in Trinidad and how it reverberated across the region, there was regime change in 1979, which did not last long, but that too is for another story, another lecture. Thank you very much, Mr. Bousquet, for sharing that experience within St. Lucia. And any other, the, the other panelists are invited to please share your perspectives on that question regarding the, from your perspective, the sustainability of the successes or the gains made during the Black Power Movement. Okay, let me, let me just say very quickly. Uh, first, I, I, the issue of the economics. We sustained it um, in Trinidad and Tobago for remarkably long, but in the last few years, you've had a steady erosion. And I'm talking in terms of the major 
industries now. And um, unfortunately, I don't have the exact um, information in front of me, and I'm, I, I should have had it. But the thing is that a lot of um, enterprises that had been nationalized, some significant ones have gone back to the, uh, to the foreigners. And there is, uh, generally there's a move in that direction that, that, is taking, that is taking place now. You see, we have had a lot of challenges with the, with the management of these enterprises. And it's not because of a lack of capacity. It is that when things fall under government ownership, when enterprises fall under government ownership, and it applies to utilities as well. What happens is that you have political padding in management and therefore you don't always get the best management. You also have political considerations that go into a number of critical decisions that business has to make. And as a result of that, we have seen um, reversals and we, we, we're still on a, a path of more reversals. That is unfortunate. I also want to respond to something that uh, Brother Ayaguru said, and I, I, I want to say that um, I have to re-emphasize what he said. In Trinidad and Tobago, when we spoke about Black and Black power, it referred to Africans and Indians. And that was very clear. And it only didn't come out of what I was saying because I just had to stop suddenly because uh, I know the importance of us stopping in time that the students can participate and others can participate. So it is not because anything that has been written by me or said by me where I have a full chance to speak has always included that very important element of the Black Power Movement in Trinidad and Tobago. It was a critical element and it is still my philosophical position because ethnically, I am African. Black to me is a, a broader definition, but ethnically on a personal level, I am, I am African and I respect people who are Indian or Chinese or have other ethnicities. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Cambon. Ms. Professor Sweet? Yeah. Uh, of, often people ask the question, what have we gained? Well, I am not going to list, I've engaged in that before, the gains of 1970. And some of the other speakers have, have included that in their presentation. But I, I would like to answer a question that, as they say, is up in your face. Since 1970, while there were gains, there seem to have been a lot of sliding backwards and in certain cases, things have gotten even worse for some people. Poverty and inequality in the society has increased. And I'm afraid this is not only a Trinidadian problem, but a regional problem of the growing inequality in the Caribbean as has been observed in a lot of the Western economies that the inequality gap has increased. Associated with this inequality and poverty is the so-called ghettoization and the impact on the education. And one of the central issues, um, Omi raised the question about the cause of the introduction of the CXC. And I would like to suggest that we now have the benefit of 52 years and that we are at that crossroads now where we are seeing the stark reality that our education system was designed more than 30 years ago and that it is not in phase 
with the problems or the need for development. We have by and large, we are by and large at that point when I believe CXC and CAPE have to be seriously redesigned urgently. And this is not only because of the failure to, to train people, enough people for development, but that development for what purpose and in what context. Education cannot be the same thing in perpetuity. The economic situation in the Caribbean has radically changed. But I'm afraid that our education system has not changed. It has remained tied in that vision, in some extent, a pre-1970 vision. And that is the first thing. The next thing I would like to say is that several of the speakers mentioned the question of reparation. Reparation must be seen as a two-phase issue. Reparation for the descendants of African enslavement during the period of enslavement. That is from 1502 in Hispaniola, Trinidad a later, up to 19, 1834. That is one issue that has to be directed. Reparation for the descendants of the African enslaved for the period of 1838, 34, 38 to 1962, the colonial period in Trinidad and the Anglophone Caribbean is a question exclusively for the British. And I believe that that is a separate and burning issue. There's a third question of reparation, which some may call not relevant to us, but I believe it is equally relevant. That is the reparation for the African people and the African continent. That is a very important part of what is going on. And we saw the continued rape of Africa, particularly after 18, 84, 85, and the Berlin Conference. But today, 2021, we are seeing a surge of a number of countries, some of those who were signatories to the Berlin Conference, who have started a rush for Africa. Because Africa does not only have the old gems and jewels of gold, etc., but some of the modern materials that are required for the fourth and fifth industrial revolution, computers, IT, the information age, robotics, reside in the African continent. And I'm afraid that that is why the question of reparation for the African continent is an important issue. I believe that, that today, while we are faced with the pandemics and all these other things that are important, that the central issue facing the Caribbean region, not only the black people and not only the Anglophone thing, Caribbean, is the question of reparation in the Caribbean. We in the Caribbean states are in serious economic trouble. We are indebted to the international banks and they have been levying interest rates that are virtually impossible to achieve. Poverty will continue in the Caribbean to get worse. We are not going to find any radioactive material in the deposits in the Caribbean. Petroleum is no longer a pet subject. We have to address what is the economic path forward. And I'm afraid that the wind of change now is separation. There's a big separation where all the Caribbean territories are seeking each one to go it alone. My humble position is that out of 1970, 
the debate, the discussion about the state of the Caribbean is that by ourselves, we have no economic future. That the decade, the next two decades are going to be pain and tears and more poverty and more inequality and more crime. And therefore, our future in the Caribbean lies with revisiting the Shaganamas Convention. We have to come up with a new concept of a CARICOM that is bigger than the existing constitutions. People are je jealous about their own politics. And therefore, I believe that the new CARICOM has to be an economic CARICOM. And let us leave for a later time the political aspect. But we need to address urgently the question of the economic path forward for the Caribbean and CARICOM. That is a bigger CARICOM than the Anglophone Caribbean territories. And therefore, CARICOM has to address urgently, by way of discussing the economic path forward, a wider participation. And they have to come urgently together. COVID has told us that we do have a choice. That while we are prepared to some extent for natural disasters, we are unprepared for epidemics. I will stop. Thank you very much, Professor Sweet. We have a roughly five more minutes left for this um, session this morning. And we do have one more question to take, but I know that Prof Mr. Ome wanted to also uh, make a contribution. Uh, th thank you very much, um, Dr. Gift. I'm sorry. The, the, <laughs> sorry. The, yes, but the, um, the last very voluble expression tossed me out of what I wanted to say. My goodness. I'm, I'm back now. I'm, I'm back. My I problem is this. Questions. My apologies. Yeah, but you know, we have very limited time, sir. My problem is this, um, because I have to leave shortly. I have another Zoom conference. I want to make a suggestion here because I'm sorry we didn't have many questions from students, but I want to make a suggestion. And it's something that many of us have spoken of for a very, very long time, that we make history a mandatory subject on our curricula whether it is for examination or not, and not just political history, not just economic history, but out of respect for people like Dr. Sweet, the history of engineering in, in the Caribbean. R right now, we have a serious situation in Trinidad and Tobago. They are likely, I'm being careful in saying that, to privatize our water and sewage authority. But we, we have no history of the winning of water in Trinidad and Tobago. If it is there, I am not aware of it. My problem is, let us see if we can lobby to make history mandatory. And I, I want to add something here. Why I said this, because um, Brother Buske made a very important point about the St. Lucia Cooperative Bank. There was a, a Trinidad and Tobago Cooperative Bank established in 1914 that was also called the Penny Bank. And you joined with a penny. It was a black bank, but only in 1970 was that bank able to issue checks. There was that constraint, but that penny bank in Trinidad and Tobago was actually formed by black men. That is all I have to say. I'm sorry, but I have to leave the discussion at this point. Thank you very much for having me. And um, I, I want to give my own consideration to all who have been able to play a part in today's symposium. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. Ome, thank you very much for making yourself available to be part of our panel this morning and for staying until this time. You did say that you had another commitment. We're very grateful that you were able to share with us your perspectives. And You're wish welcome. you all the best. Thank you. So we do have another question. Um, oh, I'm seeing two. So let's see if I can get through these questions quickly now that I'm coming in. Um, first question is, why was some of the much revolutionary spirit for Black consciousness historically not sustained? 
And the second question is, could we not have had a youth on the panel? It might have been empowering for a youth delegate. Great discussion, thanks. So the first question, why was some of the much revolutionary spirit for black consciousness historically not sustained? I would bow to Professor Sweet on that. And let us bear in mind that we have very few minutes left because we normally will, will end at 12. Briefly, I would say that the revolutionary spirit may not have been seen on platforms, but at least the gentlemen that you had on this panel continue to work and some of them expanded their work. My particular area, for instance, I became an engineer and I decided to set about research in construction in the local environment and issues that affected construction and economics. So my involvement was that we had to get involved in doing things. Where we were excluded before, we now had a chance to get involved. And I set about training what I considered was a new generation or two of engineers in the Caribbean that would see themselves as being technically the leaders of the region. Mr. Cambon, thank you very much, Professor Sweet, for that perspective. Yes. Okay, yeah. I, I just want to say something very quick on, on, on it. Um, and uh, you have areas in which it has been sustained and they are significant but you also have areas in which you have seen the decline of consciousness because for anything to be sustained, it has to be institutionalized. And there are many individuals and organizations who have done things towards that. But when it is not adopted at a broad level, you have problems. And our education system, which is so critical and which the youth did so much to try to get change, and did manage to bring about some changes, still does not reflect things that would give, and particularly Africans, pride in themselves. Because in the Indian community, the difference is that you have communal institutions that make up for, the, for what is absent in the education uh, system. So that, that the education system, and I'm glad I'm speaking to young people, because I don't know what it is like in St. Lucia, but if it is not teaching people their history in a way that can make them proud of themselves, that is a problem. If we are not dealing with a kind of cultural education that would give our people uh, a sense of pride in themselves and their parents and everything else, because you look at, and I look at one area in which you didn't see the sustenance of the thing, is that most women in the society started to wear their hair natural. We realized that our natural African hair was beautiful, just as we recognize that our natural dark skins were beautiful. But then you have all the pressures coming on afterwards. The images that are constantly projected in the media. You observe the trade art media, I don't know for St. Lucia, and you see that, especially when it comes to women, it is still the lighter skinned woman, and it is still women whose hair is either processed or it is naturally straight. And, and, and you don't get enough featuring of that African image on the media to give people a confidence to maintain the values that they got out of 1970. So you have a lot of, a lot of pressures on the system where that is concerned. And um, we have to therefore institutionalize a lot of things. I, I wanna say something else. You see how the way the, way the forces work, for example, the reparations issue. I'm extremely dissatisfied on the way the government of Trinidad and Tobago uh, does not, you, you, you have not had a word out of our prime minister on the issue of reparations. The only time he actually used the term is in talking about land for, 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 for a Baptist cathedral. And he put that as reparations, land coming from this government. You know, and, and, and that is something that is so sad because it is a movement that those whom we are fighting against have tried to destroy ever since it started to develop at a pan-African level. When you had the first uh, 
International Reparations Conference. It was organized by Chief Moshu Abiola in Nigeria. And he, after that, became a president of Nigeria, and he was never allowed to assume office. He was put into jail, and the day on which he was come out to come out of jail, uh, after a few years, uh, because of international pressures, he was visited by a U.S. delegation, and someone who is still prominent in U.S. politics was part of that delegation, and she gave him a cup of tea in his cell, because he always used to have a taster, but on the day he used to come out, he has relaxed his security. And I, she gave him that cup of tea. And after that, he collapsed and never recovered. So, so, it, so, so, the, so we are up against tremendous opposition with reparations, but it is critical. And if we don't at least fight for it, because the very fight for it is rehumanizing. And therefore we have to take up that fight for reparations, even for our own humanization but also because with that, we will win the victory for it. Thank you very much, Mr. Cambon. And um, just to add that on the question of making history mandatory, I know that the director of the Center for Reparation Research, Professor Shepard, is definitely a strong advocate for that. And hopefully that she will be able to influence as well as other educators, CXC, to pressure governments to include history as a mandatory subject on the curriculum, which will facilitate the institutionalization of which you speak. And we, um, have to defend, we, have to, we have to be careful who writes the new history. We, yes, definitely, okay. definitely. Um, on the question of the suggestion of having a youth on the panel, um, Mr. Busque, you want to comment on that at all, that suggestion? Well, um, um, I, I was pleased up until that comment. Um, I was pleased that my mother would have considered that I'm the youngest on the panel. I'm the furthest from 100 years old. Um, but given the nature of the topic um, that we're talking about history they never taught us, and we are looking at a period that precedes um, uh, you know, the current generation of young people, um, we found it, we did not really think that we should try to um, get young persons to teach other young persons about a time um, that they would not have known of. And as Dr. Suma pointed out, this oral history lessons coming from us to them um, is part of the continuation of the African tradition of elders um, um, being those who have more age and therefore more experience and more wisdom and not necessarily those who are documented with certificates that cannot land them jobs. And uh, thank you, Mr. Bousquet for that. And as you have the mic, may I, as I don't think we have any other questions, nor do we have, oh, there's another question here. You said Maybe there was a second one, yeah. The second I'll be one very brief. The second one was about the youth on the panel. Oh there's yeah, another, okay. There's another one coming up. Um, foreign intelligence penetrated the black revolutionary spirit in the Caribbean. This caused division among revolution, revolutionary forces in the region. Maybe we could take a quick comment, a quick comment from our panelists on that statement, the influence of foreign intelligence in the black revolutionary movement. Whether that was, was whether that was in fact so or not, or to what extent uh, was it applicable to Trinidad or other Caribbean countries? Well, there, there's no way you're going to have a revolutionary process that challenges uh, the powerful countries of the world, of which the United States is the most powerful, and not get that kind of, of um, I mean, systematic effort are trying to undermine and destroy what was, what was achieved. And because of the fact that the elites in the society who don't want a continuation of that consciousness, they, they, that's another factor to, con to consider, not just those from the outside. Because the, that control of media, that, that control of education system, those are very important things. I don't think it's accidental 
that the education system has not undergone. It's undergone many different changes, but not the kind and quality of change that is necessary to overcome some of the hang-ups that come out of colonialism and also to take us forward with that sustained pride in self. And this applies particularly to the African because the Indian community has its own internal dynamic where that is concerned. We did not have a systematic an attack on their sense of being as you had on the African. So a combination of what the African was fighting against and that failure in the education system, that failure in the media and from our consciousness point of view, not from their point of view, because I think a lot of them, they know exactly what they are doing. And the undermining, the buying out of people, all kinds of things take place uh, because of foreign involvement, even when it is not visible. Professor Sweet, thank you, Mr. Cambon. Professor Sweet, two minutes or your reflections on that all question. I, all I wanted to say is that I would like it noted that the three participants are supporting that point that Brother Cambon said that we all want the teaching of history as a compulsory part of the education from primary school. And as a corollary, we have to revisit it even at university level. That engineers should not be able to graduate without doing a developmental course in that is necessary, whether it's medicine, law, engineering, that we have to we have to be very, very careful. I support, I want to say that I'm supporting Brother Ome and Brother Cambon that history must be compulsory in the next rendition. Yes, I think we're all in agreement with that, Professor Sweet. And we have to draw on our best conscious historians, like the late Dr. Tony Martin from the, from, from the region and, and others who have written on a certain mode. It's not just any history or any African history because most African history is garbage. Most, most that is presented to us as African history is garbage. And therefore we have to be very selective um, and in, when we go about and way it's introduced in the curriculum. Yes, thank you very much for that, Mr. Cambon. So before I invite uh, Mr. Bousquet to give us a vote of thanks, there's one more comment that I would share. Uh, it says Caribbean to the world, not really a question as such, but I'm noticing in these video panel discussions, a lack of inclusion of the Rastafari, the vanguard of African slash black liberation since the 1930s. Is this a, sim a symptom of academic white tower slash elitism? Uh, so I would probably ask Mr. Bousquet to yes. briefly comment on that and to then go into the vote of thanks and then I will give my closing remarks. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I'm very pleased. Um, we want to uh, let our Rastafari brethren and all people who know of the role Rastafari played in uh, bringing about, first of all, the sense of repatriation and with that, the sense of reparations um, from the 60s up until now. Um, that has not ever escaped those who established the CARICOM Reparations Commission. It did not escape the government of St. Lucia at the time. We actually have two uh, Rastafari entities um, um, represented on our national committee, the Ayanola Council for Advancement of Rastafari and the Caribbean Rastafari Organization. And it will also please them to know that at the meeting of the Prime Ministerial Subcommittee responsible for reparations in CARICOM, that meeting was held on the 9th of December, uh, sorry, the 9th of, of, of February, and a decision was taken there, um, which was adopted yesterday, calling on governments that have not done so to ensure not only that Rastafari youth and uh, other important sectors are indigenous people, Rastafari youth and indigenous people are represented on the committees, but also to create 
position to allow for those entities where not represented to be able to participate in the meetings of the CRC um, on the basis of invitations. So um, no, Rastafari has not been left out. And in 2021, uh, we will see and hear much more um, about the acknowledgement of the role of Rastafari and more appreciation of the fact that Rastafari is present on almost, if not every single National Reparations Committee from Jamaica to Guyana. In terms of our thanks, we want to um, thank every single one of you who have uh, made today possible. We want to start, first of all, with our thanks to you, uh, Madam Chair, Dr. Sandra Gift, who um, has, um, we don't know, she didn't say, but um, part of her responsibility at the University of the West Indies was for ensuring quality. And I would like to um, acknowledge that she bring, did bring that to bear in the way in which she uh, handled our sessions today. Um, very much thanks from all of us to you, uh, Dr. Gift. We want to thank each of our presenters. Um, and uh, we certainly appreciate the fact that each and every one of them as Professor Sweet pointed out, each and every one of them have supported the call for education to be made compulsory at university level. And sorry, history, history, history sorry, to be made um, um, compulsory at university level. And as Dr. Giff pointed out, this is one of the um, main um, demands um, on our part. And also, we want to thank the team at UWI Open Campus, Sigutani, who is not with us today, but has always played a leading role, um, along with Miguel and Kevin, who are with us today. But principally, um, it would not have been possible without the active role and support of the director, Mrs. Leslie Crane Mitchell. Also, the UWI Open Campus Marketing and Communications Department, which is the team that is ensuring that you can see us, um, be part of our discussion, and taking this discussion twice a, a month on the third Thursday and every um, fourth Thursday, the third Thursday, our national lectures, and the fourth Thursday, um, our school lectures of every month. We can never stop thanking uh, Cherise, David, and uh, the others at uh, the marketing department and uh, communications department. We want to thank our member entities, the Nobel Laureates uh, Festival um, Committee, the Monsignor Patrick Anthony Folk Research Center and Monsignor Patrick Anthony himself, the Archaeological and Historical Society, the uh, Ayanola Council for the Advancement of Rastafari, the Caribbean Rastafari Organization, um, Mr. Nkrumah Lucian, a lecturer at St. Mary's College who um, is heading the committee taking care of the St. Lucia aspect of our school lectures. We want to also thank the Center for Reparations Research and its director, Professor Shepard. But we also particularly want to thank uh, Mr. Michael Hilton, uh, Gabriella Hemmings, uh, uh, our friend um, Floyd. Uh, we want to thank all of them who, along with Dr. Gift, meet on a monthly basis um, many, many times ahead of each lecture to organize and ensure that the lectures are in keeping with our mandate, are in keeping with what uh, we have to do. And um, if there's anybody um, left out, it's because I decided not to read my usually five minutes long thank you list. And I hope I've touched everybody. And um, thanks again to all of those out there at the schools, the teachers, the lecturers, the principals, those at home under lockdown, the students, the parents, the guardians, the, um, everybody who has been with us over the last two hours. We thank you for joining our fifth um, lecture and we invite you to stay tuned. You cannot forget the date. It's the fourth Thursday of every month from 10 in the morning to 12 o'clock East Caribbean time. Save the date and we look forward to being with you next time.
Thank you very much, Mr. Bousquet. We trust that our participants, and in particular our students, would have a better appreciation of the range of issues that led to the Black Power Movement. But in particular, issues, well, let me see. Issues, uh, I, I think Professor Sweet identified the streams of influence, a wide range of streams of influence impacting the Black Power Movement and within which you have been able to identify issues relating to industrialization, nationalization, and US imperialism to support your ongoing preparation for your examinations. As these events occurred in Trinidad and Tobago and the interventions made by the leaders of the movement. We have really been most fortunate this morning to have first-hand reflections from leaders, from the icons of this movement who were courageous and committed to a cause. They were part of a movement of critical thinkers very clearly, which is what educators today seek to encourage in our young people. Should you be interested in more information, and we've had lots of information being shared about books that you can read, sources to which you can go, should you be interested in more information, another documentary source is a book titled The Black Power Revolution or Retrospective, edited by Selwyn Ryan and Taimun Stewart, and that includes the perspectives of our speakers this morning, among others. The book was published in 1995. We offer our thanks again, and I offer my personal thanks as well, to Mr. Omi, Professor Sweet, and Mr. Cambon, for sharing your stories with us this morning, your reflections, and we wish you everything that is good going forward. Thank you very much and see you next time at our next lecture.